The Gospel of Luke was written to an audience who lived in perilous times. As followers of Jesus, they were seen as threat to the Roman Empire because to call Jesus Lord was to imply that the emperor was not. Jesus spent his professional career preaching about the kingdom of God and any kingdom other than the Roman Empire was seen as, as a threat. Luke's audience was also seen as a threat to the Jewish religion because their rabbi, Jesus, challenged the status quo of a religion that had become corrupt, groaning under the weight of its own power and privilege, much like Christianity has become even today. Since Christians were a threat to both the Roman Empire and Jewish traditions, they endured persecution and demoralization by those who were more powerful than they, which pretty much meant everyone. And it was for these people, these people who never knew if they would be thrown into prison, stripped of their property and possessions, or executed because of their faith. It was for these people that the gospel writer recorded the words of a revolutionary. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. When they slap you on one cheek, turn and give them the other. When they take your coat, let them have your shirt as well. Jesus wasn't trying to get them to be nice people. He was teaching them how to be a revolutionary like him. He was teaching them about passive resistance. Almost 2,000 years later, another revolutionary named Martin Luther King Jr. would lift up Jesus' words as a light for African Americans who struggle under the oppressive weight of white supremacy. In his sermon entitled, Loving Your Enemies, he said, to our most bitter opponents we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We shall meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we shall continue to love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Throw us in jail and we shall still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children and we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process and, in, and our victory will be a double victory. Dr. King wasn't telling the people to roll over like a whipped dog quivering in some corner and licking the hand that had beaten them. He was preaching resistance to the evils of prejudice and bigotry. He was offering up the teachings of Jesus as a lesson in passive resistance. Not many years later, the LGBTQ community would find their voice and revolt against a homophobic and transphobic culture that used every means available to subjugate them. One year before what has come to be known as the Stonewall Riots, another revolutionary named Troy Perry would answer God's call to start a church which proclaims God's love for the LGBTQIA community, a church which goes by the name of the Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches. And today on this All Saints Sunday, we pay tribute to those no longer with us in body, 
but very much with us in spirit, who provided the foundation upon which our church is built. We honor these MCC saints who were as passionate in their demand for justice for the LGBTQIA community as was Dr. King in his demand for justice for the African American community. And Jesus' insistence that love be the bedrock for every response to persecution was key to their activism. We honor people like Reverend Elder Richard Plowen, who passed away just last year at the age of 91. Reverend Elder Troy Perry said he was the first clergy to visit me when I first founded the church. Previously, he was a Presbyterian missionary to the Sudan and was the Dean of Students at Chapman College in Orange County, California, USA. Troy asked him to start Samaritan College because seminaries at that time would not let MCC students attend as openly gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. In 1970, Plowen was appointed at MCC's first general conference to the first board of elders of our denomination. We also honor people like Reverend June Norris, who died of cancer in 2010. June didn't know much about gays and lesbians when she accepted a nephew's invitation to attend a new church in the early 1970s. She wasn't gay and she had never considered a life in the clergy, but the visit to the MCC church in Los Angeles changed the course of her life. Within a few years, she was the first heterosexual and second woman to be ordained in MCC. We honor people like Reverend Dolores Berry, who passed away two years ago. Dolores was a character. She could belt out a song like no one's business. She preached prophetic sermons and she touched the lives of thousands of people with her gifts of exuberance, prayer, and truth-telling. She will be profoundly missed. We honor people like Reverend Elder Jerry Ann Harvey, who died in 2008. Jerry Ann, born into a Cherokee Nation family, was a larger-than-life preacher, healer, and evangelist. She confronted the Ku Klux Klan in Texas. She battled for civil rights in California. She had an instinct for holding a crowd in the palm of her hand and a weakness for beautiful women, which she did not hide. She loved jewelry. Texas cuisine and laughter. Reverend Elder Don Eastman said of her, she was needy, she was giving, she was infinitely entertaining, she was a drama queen, but when she held you and prayed for you, you knew you were in the arms of Jesus himself. We honor people like Reverend Elder Jean White, who died in 2010. Jean had a story unlike any of our stories. She had been a missionary to Macau with the China Inland Mission and had been imprisoned by the Red Chinese Army during the Cultural Revolution in the mid to late 60s. She was tortured, lost her lung, and nearly lost her life. When she was rescued, she was on the front page of the London Times, a national hero. Just a few years later, when she came out to her fundamentalist community, she was rejected. Not long afterwards, she heard Troy Perry speak, and her life changed again forever. In addition to being a pastor of MCC London, Jean also reached out to other continents and countries, to isolated LGBT clergy who wanted to connect with MCC. She was a metaphorical midwife to MCC's first serious global efforts. There are many more saints that I would like to share a portion of their story with you. 
but we don't have enough time for that today. The point I'm trying to make is that these were phenomenal people in their own right. They were flawed, but that didn't keep them from answering the call of God. It's because of them and many more like them that you and I are fortunate enough to worship the way we do today. Each in their own way resisted the notion that LGBTQIA people are anything less than children of God. They spoke out for our rights and they proclaimed God's love. They are our spiritual ancestors, a cloud of witnesses who surround us with their courage and infuse our spirits with their passion if we open ourselves to them. It's essential that our legacy not end, that their legacy not end with us. We have a gift for the world that we received from them, a gift that is the message of God's love and grace for everyone, no exceptions. We must never take for granted their legacy, nor the legacies of Reverend Dr. King or Jesus Christ himself. We stand upon their shoulders and they lift us up. May we do the same for others. Amen.